Good afternoon, buona tarda in Barcelona. And could I start by just thanking you very much for this opportunity. For four billion years, the Earth wandered through the solar system accompanied only by one moon, one satellite, the moon that we all know and love. Until one day in the month of October 1957, we heard this sound coming from space for the first time. And this was the sound of a shiny beach ball flying around the Earth. The uh, launch was called Sputnik in Russian, that means satellite. And this was the first object which man had put into space and the first thing to accompany the Earth other than our own original natural satellite. But things moved on very fast. And well, less than three years later, we had our first images from space of the Earth itself. And this is taken from the first weather satellite, TROS-1, launched in 1960 by the United States. And so began the first in the long story of Earth observation, which has persisted until today. Since then, we've had much more exotic images than the first one, which you saw. This shows an area in the northwest United States, extremely beautiful images. The next one is uh, an area of sand in the southern Iranian desert. These are radar images of the Ruwenzori Mountains, the Mountains of the Moon, in western Rwanda. And here is an image of some very exotic looking sand dunes in southern Namibia and southwest Africa. Not only on the land, but also in the ocean. Uh, the phytoplankton bloom, where very billions of very small organisms in the sea are collected by the currents in the Earth's oceans and form these beautiful shapes. The Amazon Basin very famous. I'm sure you're very familiar with some of the images which have been shown, which are helped to understand deforestation. And sometimes man has a hand in nature as well. And here you see the sort of classic uh, patterns which derive from uh, artificial irrigation, in this case in Kansas, in the United States. And perhaps the most beautiful of them all, this could really be a, a work of art. This is a, a triple frequency radar image of the delta, the inland delta of the Okavango River in southern Africa, an incredibly important area for biodiversity, but also a wonderful thing to have on your wall. But we do many more things than simply have pictures of the Earth. There are many different ways that we observe the Earth. And this is a very exotic way. This is a, a satellite called Goche. Uh, it's also called the Ferrari of space because it looks like a very aerodynamic satellite. And the reason it's built like that is that it flies very low, 250 kilometers up which is not very far away. If you had a fast car, you could drive there in an hour. Its space isn't very far away from us. And this measures very precisely the gravitational field of the Earth. Very, very precisely to one part in a thousand billion. One part in 10 to the 12. That's the difference between the mass of a super tanker when a very small snowflake lands on it. And that's what you're measuring. So it's a pretty clever measurement. And this, in fact, has a, a lifetime of two years, but it actually lived for four years until last Sunday when it came down in the South Atlantic and a bird watcher in the Falkland Islands took this picture as it came down and dropped into the Atlantic Ocean. So it's finally come to rest, but only after having done an extremely good job of giving us the best gravitational field to the Earth ever and the best geoid. The geoid is the shape of the Earth, but simply, it's the shape of the Earth if you didn't have any land, you didn't have any mountains. Imagine the Earth were covered completely with ocean. What would its shape be? Well, it wouldn't be quite smooth because different changes in the density uh, inside the Earth mean that the surface of the Earth is actually distorted by those mass concentrations. And what you see here is an area in, uh, for example, here you see in the, the Indian Ocean, which drops to about 150 meters below what would be a smooth surface. So it's very important we know this field. Uh, when the Channel Tunnel was built between Europe, between uh, France and the uh, United Kingdom, when the two ends met in the middle, there was a 50 centimeter difference. Not because they made a mistake, but because apparently, according to the maps, France was 50 centimeters lower than the UK. Now, we know that's not true, but they had different levels for sea level in the two places. So this gives us a unified reference system for uh, height systems all over the world. It's also very important in terms of ocean circulation, because unless we know where the ocean would be at rest, where we measure the shape of the ocean, we don't know what the difference is caused by its motion. When you blow on a teacup, you see the surface moves, and the surface is raised by the, the current you generate. We can do the same thing in the oceans. By measuring the shape of the oceans very precisely by an altimeter, 
from space and comparing it where the ocean should be at rest from geoid, from this, from Goche, we get the, what's called the ocean dynamic topography. And these are the hills and valleys in the ocean which are caused by the fact that the ocean is moving. And because uh, we then can look at the consequences of that, there are currents which flow from the hills down into the valleys. And because the Earth is rotating, it's more complicated than that. And you wind up with currents like this, which you know very well to be the Gulf Stream. So this is a way of measuring very precisely from space the shape and direction of the Gulf Stream. Another type of measurement we can make looks at very small changes in the shape of the Earth itself, very small changes in uh, land, the, the three-dimensional structure. And this is a city which I'm sure you all recognize very well, it's Barcelona. And what we have here is a series of images taken with uh, a synthetic aperture radar over a period of several years. And it shows small movements in the Earth's surface caused by uh, subsidence. And when I say small, I mean very small. This range of color goes from minus one to plus one millimeters a year. So a millimeter a year is being measured from a satellite 800 kilometers up in space. And what you can see in this particular case, if you look up here at the little area which has been expanded and magnified, you can see individual buildings which act as reflectors. And this particular building looks as though it sunk a bit. And when you went there, we went there, you found it was actually subsiding. So this is a way of uh, detecting building subsidence from space. Another way of uh, another application, the same thing is looking at the dikes in the Netherlands. So here you have a series of different images of the dike system in the Netherlands. And when we put them all together over a series of a few years, we can see here the deformation of the dikes, which ones are sinking, which ones are being raised at the rate of a few millimeters a year. And this is used by the Rijkswaterstaat in the uh, Netherlands to be able to help manage the way that they control their dike system. Of course, sometimes you have much greater movements than, than just a few millimeters a year. This is the Tohoku earthquake, the great northeastern earthquake in Japan, as it's called there, uh, which took place several years ago, 2011. And you'll see here you have the same sort of color scheme, but these contours are, each case, 50 centimeters. So in total, there was a displacement of one part of Japan to the other by a total of about four meters. And hence, you had the enormous uh, devastation that was caused. But it wasn't just local problems. It wasn't just a local earthquake. You all heard, I'm sure, the tsunami which happened afterwards. And this video shows us what happened to the tsunami in the Pacific Ocean over the course of the next 24 hours. And here you see the tsunami spreading across the ocean. Now, this isn't a video. This is not from DreamWorks or Walt Disney. This is not a cartoon. These are measurements made from space from an altimeter, which is measuring the progress of the wave across the Pacific Ocean. And 24 hours later, it reaches the Chilean coast. But what was going on at the same time in Antarctica? Again, we have a little video which shows us. This is the Antarctic ice shelf. And you can see down here that at 5.46 uh, Greenwich Mean Time, Universal Time, the Honshu earthquake took place. And 18 hours later, it reached, the tsunami reached the Antarctic and started to break up one of the ice shelves there. So we have different ways of looking at the same phenomenon. Another way, back to our old friend Goche, this was flying around 250 kilometers up in the air, still in the outer reaches of the Earth's atmosphere, which is why it has to be uh, so aerodynamic. And what we saw there were different changes in the density of the atmosphere at the level of Goche. So the shock wave propagated from down at the earthquake all the way through up to the upper atmosphere just before we get into true outer space. So we had four different ways of seeing what happened in that place in northern, uh, China, northern Japan at that time. Another phenomenon which is uh, very important, the changes in the mass of our ice sheets. And we use the same technique of interferometry, looking at small changes in the Earth's surface to see what happens over a course of several years, in this case, in the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, this is an experiment with a very large team supported by the European Space Agency and by NASA, which looked at a whole range of different techniques for monitoring the change in ice distribution. And what you see here is that in the center of the Greenland ice, field, ice sheet, you see there's still some accretion, so it's slightly rising whereas on the outside, it's losing mass through the glaciers flowing into the uh, northern Atlantic Ocean and into the Arctic Ocean. 
It's a very difficult measurement to make, and there are four different types of measurement you can make uh, to look at the same phenomenon. This was using interferometry, so actually looking at the flow in and out of the system. But there are other different techniques, I won't go into them, which give us different measurements. So what you see here is the total mass loss in terms of billions of tons a year. So it's around 150 billion tons a year, compared with the time that the measurement was made. And you can see that they don't all agree. Uh, there are different ways of bringing them together. And when they're all put together in the best way, we get these results, which show us that altogether we've seen about if we look at different time frames, it's different. If we go back to um, about 10 years ago, we were losing altogether. We had sea level rise at the level of about 0.27 or 0.3 millimeters a year as a result of ice loss from Greenland and mostly the West Antarctic ice sheet. The East Antarctic is pretty well stable. More recently, that's increased to about a millimeter a year. So this is one of the contributions, one of the three contributions to sea level rise worldwide. The rest being due to the loss of ice from glaciers on land and thermal expansion of the ocean as the ocean warms up so it rises. This is very important for us and we see sea level which has been measured now for 150 years. It started back in the 19th century with these measurements from tide gauges, essentially in situ measurements in coastal areas looking at how the sea was rising at the time. Not very accurate as you can see. And over the years, two things have happened. Firstly, the measurements are much more accurate these days. And secondly, the rate of level, the rate of the increase of sea level has increased. And if we look at more, most recently, the last 20 years, we have the best signal from satellite altimetry. It's the most precise way of making this measurement. And we see there's a general rise of about three millimeters a year. This was a particular event, the El Nino event in the Southern Pacific in 1998. You can see the trace of that in the signal. But generally speaking, it's about three millimeters a year, which is slightly worrying, but it's much more worrying if you happen to live in the wrong place. And this shows the distribution of sea level rise worldwide. Now, if you're living on the Western United States coast, it's not too much of a problem. In fact, sea level is going down there. We are on average at three millimeters a year, which is about here, this sort of pale yellowy color. But if we look at the areas where there's greater sensitivity to our sea level rise. In fact, as it happens, somewhat coincidentally, that's where we see the greatest rise. So anything up to 10 millimeters a year. So here we see, not only do we have the most rise, we have it happening in the place where uh, it causes the most damage. So it's not just about the average figure, it's about where it's happening too. This shows uh, another aspect of our observations, and it shows that observations are not enough on their own. So on the left, you see observations made of ozone in the upper atmosphere from the Envisat satellite in 2002. And on the right, you see a model of the distribution of ozone in the upper atmosphere, which takes these data, integrates them into our best understanding of the state of the atmosphere at the time, and then projects that forward as a model. At the same time, it's constantly referring back to the new data which are coming in. It's a process known as data assimilation, and the little video shows what happens. So the satellite is going round and round. It's collecting more data all the time. Uh, goes around every 100 minutes. It's using this. So this is in September 2002. And at the same time, we have a model which is telling us what the instantaneous state of the atmosphere is. But it's integrating and assimilating these data continuously. And I didn't choose this date at random. This is the date that we had a minimum over the, of the uh, ozone hole over the Antarctic. And in fact, it's split into two at that date, and you can see the reflection of that in the data on the left. So these observations are constantly updating our understanding of the model. And as the video finishes there, you can compare the two, and you can see where you have high red observations here. You, they correlate well with the positions in the model. So this was the date that we thought we might have lost the ozone hole over the Antarctic, but unfortunately, it came back very shortly afterwards. Uh, we can also use the straightforward imagery we get from space in much more easy, easily assimilated, easily used ways. And this is some work that we've done with insurance companies uh, in flooding in the upper Danube Valley. And they're very interested in using satellite data to be able to understand the extent of floods, the predict the extent of floods in the future, the vulnerability to floods in the future, and also financially to help them settle claims to understand whether there are 
claims which are valid or invalid. And what you see here is superimposed on a high resolution image from the Pleiad French series of uh, satellites. You have an image from Envisat, a radar image, which shows the natural course of the River Danube and then the extent of the flood area in light blue. And these are used in very rapidly in real, real time by the insurance industries uh, to help support that. It's all part of a much greater uh, support which we give through a number of different factors, particularly through an international charge on space and major disasters, which provides data instantaneously free of charge from all Earth observing systems to disaster relief agencies. And we've been very active in the last few days uh, in the Philippines in providing very quickly uh, satellite-based maps for the agencies who are working there. Um, one important thing to say is that all this work I've described has been coming from research satellites. The European Space Agency is a research agency. Uh, we don't do routine operational work, but we are beginning to. And in conjunction with the European Commission, we are just about to embark on a program called Copernicus, which will provide for the first time these long-term long -term continuous operational observations of the Earth from space, not by research satellites, but by the next generation operational systems, a little bit like we've had in meteorology for some time, but looking at many very different aspects of the Earth's environment. And here we see the benefit of doing that. So this is an area from the Upper Danube Valley again, and you can see this is the map where you show in this segment here. And if we see what, over a five-year period, five-day period, I'm sorry, five-day period, this is the observations that you would get from NVSAT, one research satellite which was run by the European Space Agency. Now in the future we will have two such satellites, but called Sentinels. This is what we will get next May when this Sentinel is launched. You see it's a wider swath, so you get bigger coverage, and over five days you cover virtually everywhere within that system. The following year we will launch a second in parallel with, with Sentinel-1, and we will get a second set of data simultaneously. So every day you can expect to get every part of the Earth system covered at least every two days or so by a high-resolution radar image. So this is a, a next step to move from research into an operational domain for environmental monitoring, and it's a very important step for all of us. So just to remind you how beautiful the world is that we're looking at, these are the Tibesti Mountains on the border between Chad and Libya. Um, we have a lovely world and we should look after it and the observations you get from space help that. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias.